evidence-based practices watershed moment in education came from a 1996 presentation in England given by David Hargraves called Teaching as a Research-Based Profession – Possibilities and Prospects. His opening statement set the scene for a debate that has now been raging for a quarter of a century. He said, Teaching is not at present a research-based profession. I have no doubt that if it were, teaching would be more effective and more satisfying. Despite a host of concerns uncovered in the rigorous debate that ensued around the suitability of the evidence-based model for education, governments around the world moved to establish Centers for Education Evaluation and Dissemination of Information. The information was to be available to inform government policy decisions and to equip school principals and teachers with the facts about what works. This process can be seen as part of what Salberg calls the Global Education Reform Movement, or GERM. New South Wales became a belated What Works adherent when the Centre for Education Statistics and Evaluation CEASE, was established in 2012 with a mission to be the central point of education evidence within the New South Wales Department of Education. Not content to simply determine what works, like centres from other countries, the centre published its findings under the title What Works Best in 2014 and then What Works Best 2020 Update. But is what works best best for music education? Biesta proposed that publications like What Works Best are based on a technocratic model by which the evidence, rather than teachers, sets the agenda by privileging questions about the effectiveness of educational means and techniques. While smuggling in assumptions presented as natural or facts about what is educationally desirable. In this process, the teacher is disempowered to make individualized, contextualized judgments about the applicability and suitability of what works best in their classrooms. Biesta calls this the democratic deficit of evidence based practice. He maintains that using evidence as a basis for informing practice makes intuitive sense. Teachers should surely at least be aware of the best available evidence. The question is not should evidence be used to inform professional action, but rather what role can evidence play and what role should it play? This section will juxtapose statements made in the introduction of What Works Best and What Works Best 2020 update for the purposes of uncovering smuggled in assumptions which may be at play. Biesta maintains that these assumptions raise important questions about the very idea of evidence-based practice and highlight the role of normativity, power and values. Building on Biesta's work, it is hoped this analysis will provide music educators with insights and arguments that can help them to resist unwarranted expectations about the role of evidence in their practices and even more so of unwarranted interventions in their practices. Looking first to the What Works Best 2014 introduction, the authors claim the perceived decline in performance of Australian students as suggested by trends in international assessment data over a number of years has attracted significant commentary. While New South Wales students typically perform above the Australian average, there is also some evidence of a downward trend here. At the same time, NAPLAN results have largely plateaued and over one in five New South Wales students do not complete high school, despite the well-publicized needs and demands of the knowledge economy. Now let's examine the first paragraph of the 2020 update, heralding the success of the 2014 model. Succinctly laying out the research for seven of the most effective practices in education, What Works Best quickly found a wide audience among New South Wales educators. Over the intervening years, it has remained popular and well used, providing an accessible point of entry to the evidence on effective teaching practices. The authors claim that the 2014 document not only quickly established a wide audience, but it remained popular and well used. Given this level of success and the 
effective teaching practices espoused within, would it be reasonable to expect that declines and downward trends would be arrested? At least some movement on the plateau? We can find the answer in the 2020 update introduction. The decline in the performance of Australian students in international assessments, notably the Program for International Student Assessment, PISA, has continued, and public concern about this ongoing trend has grown. The performance of New South Wales students has fallen more sharply than the rest of Australia, with a declining proportion of top performing students and an increasing proportion of low performing students across all three PISA domains. The NAPLAN results of New South Wales students have mostly continued to plateau, although HSC results are more positive. By the time of the 2020 update, the authors reveal the perceived decline has become the decline, and the previously unidentified perceivers of decline were now identified as the concerned public, whereas New South Wales students' performance in 2014 was above average compared to their Australian peers, by 2020 their PISA results had fallen sharply. Although they were able to move from largely plateaued in 2014 to mostly continuing to plateau in 2020. The 2020 update paints a picture of an education system in crisis. Continuing decline, sharp falls, declining proportions, growing public concern, and the well-publicized needs and demands of the knowledge economy. In the What Works Best introductions, the authors are using crisis terminology as a policy tool, an exercise in power, and an attempt to persuade. The message to teachers here is clear. The public has spoken, and unless you adopt teaching strategies that have been proven to work, our children won't be able to get a job, and it will be your fault. The crisis and reform maneuver is a key strategy employed by neoliberals in order to shift policy and practice in an industry toward the political right. Society is reconceived as the economy, with citizens as human capital in a world where each individual is free to compete for resources with each other, individuals in the global economy. This ideology reforms schools in order to produce human capital, workers fit for the short-term needs of global business, conforming and compliant. Thus, a common cry from neoliberal education reformers is the need to get back to basics. These basics characterized as reading, mathematics, and other skills and knowledge, which may be advantageous in the knowledge economy, must be acquired at higher levels than those of competing nations in order to ensure personal and national prosperity. Individual well-being is reframed as important, but only in terms of the relationship between well-being and greater productivity. Returning to our juxtaposition of the 2014 and 2020 What Works Best introductions, is it possible to detect a neoliberal agenda in the language used by the authors? Here are two similar statements extracted from each introduction. The well-publicized needs and demands of the knowledge economy. We know that to succeed in the knowledge economy, our young people will need to have strong foundational skills and be ready to learn new skills throughout their lives. Both the introductions make clear links to neoliberalist ideology by identifying that the knowledge economy is driving education with its needs and demands for students to have strong foundational skills. Meanwhile, lifelong learning is redirected from something one pursues because learning is good to a lifelong pursuit of new skills as demanded by the knowledge economy. This passage from 2014 does not attempt to cloak the conservative agenda behind what works best. Significantly, some of the clearest findings indicate the value of refocusing on the basics, some of the practices likely to make the biggest difference to students include telling students clearly what the learning objectives are and what success looks like modeling these, allowing students to practice them, and evaluating to what extent they have understood. 
First of all, the refocusing on the basics is neoliberalism 101. This is training masquerading as education and a clear indication of a neoliberal agenda where outcomes are predetermined. Success means scoring a high mark on a standardized test once the teacher has shown the student how to do it the right way and then tells them how well they've done according to their marks. Apple paraphrases this as good students will learn good knowledge and will get good jobs. Now we turn our attention to the author's points on learning outcomes. They assure us that although standards might have slipped in other areas, commitment remains consistent with the vast majority as committed to positive student outcomes as they were prior to 2014, while the small minority assumedly remain committed to something other than positive outcomes. There is no doubt that the vast majority of school leaders and teachers are as committed to ensuring positive outcomes for their students as they have ever been. Our school leaders and teachers remain as committed as ever to ensuring positive outcomes for our students. The statement from 2014 is problematic on at least three accounts, particularly given the empirical nature of the proclamation. Efforts to make sustainable improvements in student outcomes the holy grail of education may have been hampered by a lack of clear, reliable and accessible evidence about what really works in schools and classrooms. Firstly, the use of the reductionistic positive student outcomes is more evidence of neoliberal ideology at play. Sustainable improvements in student outcomes is the neoliberal holy grail, not the natural aim of education. The focus on student outcomes is a neoliberal move from a substantive to a technical mode of rationality. The holy grail of education is an essentially contested concept. It is not appropriate to set this out as the aim of education. Secondly, not only is it not appropriate to set the target to sustainable student outcomes as the ultimate aim of education, the use of outcomes in education is also a contested topic and therefore cannot be portrayed as a given. Furthermore, learning that is expressed as outcomes tends to favor measurable outcomes at the expense of desirable outcomes that can't be measured. In other words, not every goal of education, particularly music education, can be reduced to a learning outcome. Now we can see the thrust here as presented in both the 2014 and 2020 introductions is determine what works best in order to assuage public concern that our students are being outperformed by students from other nations in the competition to secure a job in the knowledge economy. This explains the focus on standardized knowledge and skills outcomes delivered in a standardized fashion by teacher slash trainers who follow recipes of what works best in order to produce future knowledge economy workers who outperform their international peers on standardized tests. Having set the scene for reform, the next move in the neoliberal playbook is to persuade rather than coerce people to agree to reform measures via a tactic known as governing from a distance. Through Cease and its publications such as What Works Best, the New South Wales government doesn't have to specify exactly how teachers should teach, but instead uses the evidence as a rational and non-controversial but limited range of options to shape and utilize teachers' freedom. Uncritical prima facie adoption of the information within what works best restricts teachers to particular kinds of thinking that privileges a conceptualization of education for the training of compliant, economically productive individuals rather than educating political, ethical, and aesthetic citizens. It is therefore imperative that teachers critically examine documents such as what works best to unveil the technical methods hidden in plain sight which seek to govern our classrooms from a distance. By narrowly constructing the field of education as described in the what works best introductions and then prescribing the best way to 
teach within the eight most important practices involved in raising test scores, the power to determine what can be said and by whom has been removed from teachers. Their autonomy and agency have been contained by the visible and hidden constraints laid down by the document. The neoliberal agenda is at play here by providing a document, what works best, that seems to be democratizing, promoting so-called best practices, but paradoxically allows official speakers the rhetorical power to name the world and those in it. Classroom music educators must be alert to the literalisms rampant throughout the what works best documents. We must be aware of the potential for documents such as these to be presented as beyond critique, where difference can be recast as dissent or deviance, and where rather than informing practice, the information becomes an arid hermeneutics as a substitute for live, moral, political, and intellectual debate, where teachers are left teaching a lifeless form of scholasticism that reproduces and preserves our continued isolation from the world and from each other, and that prevents us from arriving at forms of epistemic privilege that expand our democratic imaginations. This danger has been described as the tyranny of evidence-based practice. In addition to coining the term evidence-based medicine in his seminal paper, Sackett sounded a prophetic warning to the myriad of professions which would subsequently adopt evidence-based practice. He said, without clinical expertise, Practice risks becoming tyrannized by evidence, for even excellent external evidence may be inapplicable or inappropriate for an individual patient. External clinical evidence can inform, but can never replace individual clinical expertise. Ironically, that same paper may have abetted the very tyranny it was warning against by presenting a definition of evidence-based practice that has consistently been quoted in fragmented form as evidence-based medicine is the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. Evidence-based practice constructed in this way can tyrannize educators by restricting the scope of decision-making to questions about effectivity and effectiveness, and also restricting the opportunities for teachers to make their own judgments about what is educationally desirable in a way that is sensitive and relevant for their own contextualized settings. The way forward, therefore, is to reinstate the forgotten remainder of Sackett's definition. The practice of evidence-based medicine means integrating individual clinical expertise with the best available external clinical evidence from systematic research. By individual clinical expertise, we mean the proficiency and judgment that individual clinicians acquire through clinical experience and clinical practice. Increased expertise is reflected in many ways, but especially in more effective and efficient diagnosis and in the more thoughtful identification and compassionate use of individual patients' predicaments, rights, and preferences in making clinical decisions about their care. This second section of Sackett's definition brings classroom music educators and their students back into the decision-making process about their teaching and learning. It re-democratizes that which is removed by the neoliberal commandeering of evidence-based practice. Returning to the question of who gets to decide, Rima warns the need to be vindicated to be given a hard scientific rather than soft philosophical justification for existence is so great among arts educators thirsting for respect that any excuse for acceptance is likely to be embraced, even if demeaning to their art. Luce calls this music education's legitimation crisis or the constant quest for curricular legitimacy. 
There is a real danger for classroom music educators seeking legitimacy to fall unquestioningly into line with what works best methods in order to demonstrate to leadership that what happens in the music classroom is just as rigorous, scholarly, standardizable, and measurable as the other subjects. This approach to what works best blocks critical thinking and discussion and must be combated by the introduction of alternative methods explanations and definitions. This time, Rima's words might serve to encourage us. Courage, I say to myself. Keep your eye where your heart is on the unique power of music to make life special, meaningful. The surface politics can be disheartening. The depths remain nourishing. Classroom music teachers whose heart is on the unique power of music to make life special and meaningful will need to summon their courage because breaking free of the legitimation crisis, resisting the neoliberal agenda, and making a claim to be among those who get to decide will involve flipping the system, a self-emancipatory process which moves from a managerial perspective on professionalism to a more democratic, even educational professionalism. Ball warns that by acting as technicians responding to targets, indicators and evaluations where personal beliefs, commitments and passions are set aside, causing possibly unconscious inner turmoil, inauthenticity and resistance, the kinds of reforms represented by what works best does not simply change what people as educators, scholars and researchers do, it changes who they are. Therefore, it is imperative for classroom music teachers to make the courageous decision to self-emancipate. He says this process of reinvention will require semiotic guerrilla warfare. The teacher as semiotic guerrilla adopts a critical stance to documents such as what works best, a transformation of intellectuals and their relationship to the business of truth. This is why the guerrilla metaphor is so important. The battle to define teachers as technicians is conducted at the personal level, working on teachers as ethical individuals whose values such as the belief in the unique power of music to make life special, meaningful, are challenged or displaced by what Leotard calls the terrors of performativity. The antidote to this doubt and uncertainty involves a critical reconnection to the theory of education generally and music education specifically. Ball argues that it is this disconnection from theory that leaves practitioners prey to unexamined, unreflexive preconceptions and dangerously naive ontological and epistemological a priori's. He says, theory is a vehicle for thinking otherwise. It is a platform for outrageous hypotheses and for unleashing criticism. Theory is destructive disruptive and violent. It offers a language for challenge and modes of thought other than those articulated for us by dominant others. It provides a language of rigor and irony rather than contingency. The purpose of such theory is to defamiliarize present practices and categories to make them seem less self-evident and necessary and to open up spaces for the invention of new forms of experience. Through a reconnection to theory, classroom music teachers can restore that which prescriptive methods such as what works best strip away and redeem our lost cultural capital. Those significant ideas, concepts and theories about music education lying dormant in our rich literature, which has grown significantly over the last 70 years, but is often unknown to practitioners. Theory is the mechanism by which documents such as what works best can be critically examined in order to work on and against the prevailing practices of ideological subjection identified in this paper and to sap power and engage in the struggle to reveal and undermine what is most invisible and insidious in prevailing practices. The question what are we trying to achieve then might be best addressed through a reconnection to theory. For the purposes of this discussion, theory of teaching is understood as an umbrella term covering the purpose, 
application and interpretation of education and learning, including how we learn and how we should teach. Noddings offers a starting point. She asserts that each generation must examine the responses of previous generations to the key philosophical questions at the core of school-based education in order to choose what to retain and what to reimagine as they respond to changing conditions in their world. Through Noddings and Ball, we see the need for a reconnection to the history of music education, its historical philosophies, pedagogy and pedagogies, methods and learning theories. Understanding how the profession came to be disconnected from its roots may provide a means to reconnect and begin to answer Nodding's questions. Goodson further describes education reform as coming in waves. In the current wave, represented by what works best, the authors seek to draw a veil over the last at least 30 years of classroom music education and its antidotes, such as the internet, praxial music education, Green's research on informal learning, and the musical futures movement, and an explosion in ICT and music technology. Despite this incredible work, according to What Works Best, these initiatives have led to a crisis that can only be remediated through high expectations, explicit teaching, etc. Jacobi calls this phenomenon social amnesia, where problems and ideals once examined fall out of sight and out of mind, only to resurface later as novel and new. If anything, the process seems to be intensifying. Society remembers less and less, faster and faster. Classroom music teachers can begin the process of self-emancipation through the formation of a counter-memory by engaging in a critical dialogue with the history of music education, exploring how it has or hasn't ducked the pendulum swings of crisis and reform from progressive to back to basics. We must ask, how did previous generations respond to the regimes of truth of their time around the liberal and the technical? What should we retain and what should we reimagine? What are we trying to achieve? How? So are the why, what and how prescribed in what works best compatible with historically informed music education philosophical ideas? Furthermore, are they compatible with our New South Wales music syllabi? In the event of incompatibility, can we assert that what works best does not work best for classroom music education? Let us remember what history can teach us about normative philosophies of music education. Jorgensen reminds us that when we look at historical and current national standards and national curricula, there's an expectation that music teachers and their students should be engaged in a form of comprehensive musicianship that through performance and appreciation with a comparative musicological twist, this involves making and taking music by singing, playing instruments, composing and improvising music, and learning the historical and theoretical elements of music, its relation to the wider culture, and about varieties of music. She says, these kinds of musical objectives are remarkably resilient and persuasive, originating in antiquity. In remembering music education to interrogate whether what works best works best for classroom music education, we should also remember that we are governed by the various music syllabi prepared for and on behalf of the Crown in right of the state of New South Wales. The 7 to 10 course description lays the foundation of music as a medium of personal expression, with its enabling of sharing ideas, feelings and experiences to underpin an experiential approach to the teaching and learning of music. Taken together, the historical and philosophical approaches and syllabus directives all point to a music classroom where students are doing music, that is, expressing themselves through active engagement and enjoyment in integrated learning experiences involving singing, 
playing instruments, composing and improvising music in activities that are reflective of real world practices. The way these musical doings are organized and the teacher's role should provide students with opportunities to develop their capacity to manage their own learning, engage in problem solving and work collaboratively. Classroom music education experienced in this enjoyable way should be valuable to students in their daily lives in ways that encourage them to ensure music has a continuing role in their lives. Here then is a picture of classroom music education, which is connected to its historical practices and informed by key normative music education philosophies and the New South Wales syllabus for years seven to 10. It is offered as an alternative to the picture framed by the authors of What Works Best for classroom music educators to critically examine and reflect upon as a catalyst to forming their own response to the question, is what works best, best for classroom music education?